Good afternoon. Thank you and welcome to pre-summit workshop. Um, it's two o'clock and we have a very um, amazing panel here for Project Echo and a really packed agenda. So we'll start on time as uh, people come in. Um, so I'm Vimal Mishra. I'm medical director of telehealth at VCU Medical Center. Uh, and I welcome you here for pre-summit workshop on Project Echo. I wanted to just start with this agenda uh, and kind of start talking about uh, how the day is going to unfold for all of us here. So we'll start at, we started at 2, 2.15, we will have a brief introduction. If we do not have too many people, we'll just go with the mic uh, to everyone and to ask them to introduce themselves and talk about why they are here today. If we have a lot of people, then we will have to just go to the live poll. Then 2.15, we'll have uh, Erica Harding joining us uh, via Zoom. Uh, she's the Chief Replication Officer at Echo Institute. It's a really wonderful talk from her. Uh, and there will be some question and answer session at that time. Um, then Kim, uh, Kimberly Albero, um, Program Manager, Project Echo at University of Virginia Health System, will be talking about getting started with Project Echo. Um, and then um, we will be demonstrating a live mini echo session with the panel here. Um, this will be a wonderful opportunity to see how it unfolds in the in, in live term. Weizmann Institute, uh, Aggie Erickson and Mandy Lamb will be talking about uh, their project echo. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Stewart would be talking about John Hopkins project echo and uh, Dr. Mary Leopard and Dr. Joyce uh, Harrison will be talking about Kennedy Krieger Institute Project Echo. Uh, West Virginia Clinical and Trans uh, Translation Science Institute, uh, Mr. Jay Mason would be talking about their Project Echo and uh, uh, Dr. Amanda Bennett uh, from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia will, will be talking about Autism Project Echo. So um, I'm going to start with uh, Arika Harding. Uh, she will be starting as a uh, she will be joining us as Zoom from, uh, from New Mexico. Oh, terrific. It is such an honor to be here with you. I um, am really grateful that so many folks are there attending on a pre-summit um, Sunday afternoon. Really hats off to all of you for spending the afternoon with us. Um, it, some of you are well-versed in, in what ECHO is and does, and others of you are quite new to the model. So in order for us to have an exciting conversation and for you to really deeply engage with this um, fabulous panel, so uh, in order to um, enable that really fruitful conversation, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to move pretty quickly so that we can have a conversation at the end of this ECHO overview. So here we go. We are all faced with this problem and we're all facing many of the same frustrations. Um, we, are, we are struggling. We're struggling with the fact that across our states, across our regions, across our country and all around the world, not just millions, but billions of people, right? We, we are estimating that about six of the world's nearly seven billion people lack access to high quality healthcare where and when they need it. This is terribly frustrating. And at the same time, the growth in medical knowledge is greater than exponential. It's exploding. We um, had estimated back in 1950 that it would take about 50 years for the body of medical knowledge that existed at the time to double. And now it's estimated that by 2020, the volume of medical knowledge is going to be doubling every two and a half to three months. It is unfortunately and excitingly very, um, a time of great innovation, but also it can be incredibly overwhelming to keep up with all of that. And, and as a result, unfortunately, disparities around the world, and for those of us in rural communities, even more so, disparities aren't being reduced by these incredible uh, amounts of new innovations, best practices, and treatments being developed. In fact, unfortunately, they are growing. What is happening is that not everyone is benefiting equally 
from access to those innovations and best practices. And I'll give you a, a very powerful um, example of these growing disparities and this increasing lack of health equity. I'm sure you all are very familiar with similar examples in your own communities, but what we know is back in 1979, 1980, black women and white women died of breast cancer at a, almost exactly the same rate. And since then, there have been tremendous, tremendous developments in breast cancer treatments and um, individual kinds of um, survivorship techniques. Uh, all kinds of methodologies have been developed to improve women's um, mortality rates in breast cancer. However, at this point now, um, women die of, black women die of breast cancer 40% more frequently than white women die. There's a huge and growing gap. Across the board for cancer and for many other diseases, people of color die at a greater rate. And in fact, incidence rates are even greater for people of color than white people. So we are really um, struggling with this challenge that we face to get knowledge to the last healthcare mile and enable people to take care of patients that don't have access to care. So at Project ECHO, our mission and our ambition is really, really um, large. We hope to democratize medical knowledge and get, get best practice care to underserved people all over the world and improve the lives of a billion people, a billion people by 2025. And our hope is in this ambitious or even audacious goal um, that some of you will find Project ECHO a useful modality to um, address disparities in your own communities. Our primary methodology, our way of doing things differently is by moving knowledge instead of moving people. Um, we realize that we can't ask specialists, we can't ask general practice pr providers to do more. So at this point in time, we need to think about doing things differently. <clears throat> So Project ECHO is actually a pretty straightforward um, model that is based in four key principles. So here they are. This idea is first and foremost, using technology to leverage scarce resources. So the origin story of ECHO lies in hepatitis C, and you'll see how Sanjeev put scarce resources to work. And let me show you what that looks like, right? So back in New Mexico, just to take a step to the origin story of hepatitis C, in New Mexico, back in 2003, 2004, when Sanjeev created this model, there were 28,000 people who had tested positive, but only 5% of people who had tested positive were getting treatment at the time. And of all of the people who had tested positive and were entering the correction system, which was about 40% of the people entering the correction system at the time, none were receiving treatment. He was very frustrated by that lack of access and he had an eight to 12 month wait for new patients who needed to see, see him. Now, New Mexico is probably like many of your states and many of your regions. We are a large, rather poor, um, minority majority state with poor access to medical specialty care. And back in 2003, 2004, the treatment for hep C was a lot like the treatment for cancer. Essentially, it was highly toxic. Although the disease at the time was curable in about 70% of the cases, it's, it's more curable with current treatments. The side effects were really devastating. Um, anemia, neutropenia, depression, and very high rates. And honestly, primary care doctors wouldn't touch the treatment of Pepsi with a 10 foot pole because they were afraid of injuring or killing their patients. So Sanjeev decided that he would develop a system to enable the treatment of Hep C across our state and eventually develop a model that would work all over the place. His first step was to go out across New Mexico and create partnerships partnerships that extended into the community with FQHCs and community clinics. The Indian Health Service was brought into the partnership. Department of Corrections was key. Of course, our, our university um, school of medicine and our Department of Health as well. 
So again, what he decided to do looks like this. He put a group, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, you see Dr. Aurora there, and he's a hep C gastroenterologist with a pharmacist, a behavioral health specialist, and a nurse specialist in hep C. So when we talk about leveraging scarce resources, this is the expertise of a multidisciplinary team. And the, the use of technology is the idea of using multi-point video conferencing. Now we're using Zoom. In fact, that's how I'm reaching you here today um, to connect with spokes or community participants from all across our state. So it's a fundamentally one-to-many hub and spoke model leveraging technology. So the second important principle is the idea of sharing best practices. So the first thing Sanjeev did was he decided to, um, to really clarify and write down the um, approach he was taking to hep C treatment. So he, he wrote this best practice and shared it with all of these community partners. But that was simply insufficient for them to feel confident to take on the care of hep C treatment when they had never done so before. So sharing best practices is harder than it looks. Um, we know that best practices in medicine aren't simply algorithms. They are far richer. They are, they are treatment algorithms, of course, and Hep C has a very cookbook-like treatment algorithm, but then they require checklists so that a care team is making sure to hit every single treatment point required for appropriate patient treatment. And there has to be a process so that everyone on the team is engaged in this care team so that, that um, there is a task shifting happening and the community clinician is not the one responsible for all the tasks involved in appropriate care. So yes, algorithm checklists and process are, are absolutely required for best practice care in a community setting. But beyond that, what we know is that patients um, are highly variable. They differ in weight and size and, um, of course, their, their, their gender and their socioeconomic status and their literacy and their health literacy, their language, their access to transportation, so many elements um, create complexity in our patient community. And, and the idea is that we need to create community specialists, but to do that, we're going to need to scale the wisdom that specialists have based on their years and years of experience and treating hundreds and thousands of patients. So best practice in medicine is extremely customized. So what Sanjeev decided was required to master these issues of great complexity was case-based learning. And this is fundamental to the ECHO model and really differentiates it from telemedicine that many of you are very familiar with. So case-based learning, and we're going to demonstrate this for you, to master complexity is your community of learners each presenting one or two de-identified patient cases them from their own practice, from their own lives, in a very standardized and rapid format, and then a community discussion that takes place. Just like you would never give your daughter the keys to the car after she had perhaps watched a webinar or two or gone to a conference, right? We know that learning by doing is required to master complexity. And so we really bring this forth into the, into the ECHO model. ECHO is based fundamentally on um, cases, multiple cases being presented at each and every ECHO session. And finally, the fourth leg of the ECHO stool is the web-based database to monitor outcomes. So what ECHO really is, is dynamic learning loops, learning by doing, learning from each other. What we say is ECHO fundamentally is an all teach, all learn environment where best practice isn't simply dictated from the um, academic medical center, which might be the hub, but rather is um, a blend of community knowledge and um, information coming from the scientific community all creating a very rich conversation and depth of best practice. So co-management of cases, interactivity, and collaborative problem solving 
are at the core of what ECHO is and does. And it's important to recognize that telemedicine is such an important tool. For many of you, you are providing different kinds of telemedicine each and every day. You're providing care to patients who may not be able to travel to your expert sites. We know that telemedicine looks lots of different ways, right? It might be a battlefield um, form of telemedicine. It might be a dial-a-doc in an emergency room where they don't have access to every kind of specialty care. It might be primary care online, right? There are so many varieties of telemedicine and what we would often call telehealth these days. But ultimately, what unites all of those forms of telemedicine or flavors of telemedicine is the fact that there is direct patient care taking place, right? It is usually, although not always, a one-to-one -one relationship. It is usually, although not always, a one-and-done interaction. Telepsychiatry um, or teletherapy sometimes looks quite different. You might have what looks like um, a whole screen of participants, which is the group that is engaged in the um, therapy together, connected with a clinician, and they might meet week after week. But again, even in that environment, that is direct patient care, whereas ECHO fundamentally is different. Recognizing Sanjeev's frustration, going back to the origin story of ECHO, he was so frustrated because patients had to wait so long to see them. That in fact, many never showed up or many um, fell out of line. They became too sick or it was simply not possible for them to travel. And, and so he needed to find a way not just to bridge the gap of distance and have the patient uh, seen remotely, but rather he wanted to enable more care, a capacity building model that would change the system so that the overall capacity to provide more care at the right place, at the right time, is amplified. ECHO fundamentally, at its core, is an amplification of the expertise of all kinds of specialists, like many, many of you in the room. So you can see that exhibited at the top, that ultimately what we are seeking to do is use an expert hub team connected to learners across community-based sites to then um, develop expertise, growing expertise slowly over time, bit by bit in a very adult-centric, relevant, case-based manner so that they can turn around and take care of hundreds or thousands of patients in the community. And they can appropriately triage patients because not all the care is going to be moved from the academic medical center or the hub site into the community, but rather right care, right place, right time means that the 20 or 30% of patients who are simply too sick or who are too urgent to be seen safely in the, in the community are, are immediately triaged to the care site, to the academic medical center or the hub. What happened with Sanjeev is that the waiting list went down for him. The wait time went down from eight months to two weeks after about a year to a year and a half of doing ECHO. Patients all across the state, whether they were in small rural communities or they were in Albuquerque where our hub was located, were able to get the right care, the right place, the right time within two weeks. So there is a very powerful system triaging effect that takes place over time with ECHO. Now, the community participants are our audience. Yes, patients ultimately benefit. And again, apologies to any of you who are thinking outside of the medical ECHO box, because we're talking about medical ECHO, and ECHO has now been applied very appropriately outside of medicine, but we're going to go with the medical um, sort of uh, description here. So what it's bringing to these community participants who are our audience members is a mix of work and learning, professional interaction, no cost continuing education access, and immediate and enabling access to a special, specialist team who they can consult on a regular basis when they need to. Again, this is what it looks like on the screen. This is what it looks like from the hub when you see the community of participants and a brief didactic being shared. 
we try to make sure that a didactic or lecture portion of an echo session represents a very short period of time, maybe 15 or 20 minutes out of an hour, hour and a half or two hour session. So the, the technology we use is very straightforward. You actually have exactly this technology on your smartphones, right? A camera, a microphone, a screen, a computer, and internet access. We use Zoom these days, and we have a number of resource tools that we have developed or purchased to provide our partners globally without charge. And these are Echo Box, the archive of all good things Echo, so that nobody has to recreate the wheel and you can draw upon the innovations and um, intellectual property shared by one another and a tracking tool that's not patient outcome tracking, but rather programmatic tracking. Now, I could spend a lot of time talking about the wonderful evaluations that we have done. And again, we are an enabling entity. We do echo ourselves. We are a hub for lots of different echo, but we are also um, the sort of mothership of the echo movement and we recognize that um, it is our partners that are now doing ECHO. We are now um, at nearly 200 ECHO hub sites spread across 29 countries globally. So we could talk a lot about evaluation, but the truth is we want to keep this very conversational. I simply want to point out that all kinds of assessments initially just of our um, partners, our participants was done gauging their self-efficacy um, and gauging their sense of um, uh, confidence and competence. And most importantly, I want to show you number five, because this is really the core of what we want ECHO to be able to do. Serve as to enable a provider in a community to serve as a local consultant, right? To essentially become a mini expert, whether it's in hep C, opiate addiction, or any other area of great complexity. Um, we want them to feel so comfortable that they not only do a better job seeing their own patients with that complex condition or disease, but they become the first point of referral for the, the clinicians in their practice or across their community or across the whole catchment area. That they become the place where, they, where certain kinds of patients who are complex get seen. So overall competence increasing, diminishing professional isolation, Etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we know that self reporting, how good you feel by doing ECHO, isn't enough. So, ECHO has been challenged as a methodology in a full on clinical trial published in New England Journal of Medicine. Many of you have seen this, published back in 2011. And the results were, were, were remarkable, right? Showing that care provided by community participants engaged in ECHO learning was as good or better than the care received by patients who actually went to the academic medical center, which was UNM, and saw the very same clinicians who were teaching the ECHOs. So that is really exciting. We, we see no statistical difference between the two, uh, genotype one and two, uh, again, using these older protocols that were um, in place back in 2003, 2004, 2005. But what is profoundly different here is access to minorities for care was dramatically improved for clinics that were providing care through ECHO. So that was really validating and allowed us to think about here are those sites. This is a map of New Mexico and all the sites where patients were able to receive care. But um, what's really important to illustrate is the growth in capacity. Back in 2004, our, our UNM liver care clinic was seeing about 100 patients a year with FC. Now they see about 250. But the ECHO sites are seeing more than 1,000 cases a year and treating and curing hep C across the state. So what we realize is that this is an effective model far beyond hep C. These are some of the criteria that we um, use, although it's not exclusive to this, this was a guideline that helped us think about where the echo sweet spot was. But what we really know is that echo isn't a magic bullet for everything. It is a teaching and amplification methodology that is uniquely appropriate to issues of dynamic complexity, where protocols are changing rapidly, where learning 
by doing is going to be required where enabled guided practice is going to make the difference between simply knowing and actually doing. And those of you who are uh, implementation science geeks know how hard this is, that it's, it's far easier to get a community of practice to know what to do than to actually get them to do it. And an ECHO is uniquely suited for helping providers adopt and adapt treatment protocols that they otherwise would not. So we've expanded our ECHOs. This is our ECHO menu at the University of New Mexico to some really interesting topics, some of which are no longer purely clinical. So our antimicrobial stewardship ECHO is an excellent example of learning applied to a quality improvement um, a, a problem base, right? This is the, the, um, the cases they're presenting in some cases are clinical and they are individual patients with a antimicrobial stewardship or, or a particular um, profile. But in many cases, these are um, individual hospitals or individual um, departments within the hospital or even very specific problems that have been faced by a nursing or community of um, quality improvement staff that is trying to improve the infection rates um, and contamination rates for certain kinds of um, equipment, for example. Um, the crisis intervention for community policing, I'd like to draw your attention briefly to that uh, issue um, listed on Tuesdays. This shows the difference between mandatory training and ECHO. In New Mexico, we have been highlighted for our high rates of um, police abuse of force, unfortunately, like some of your communities as well. And, um, and that's true in spite of the fact that our police officers get 40 hours every year of mandatory um, training in crisis de-escalation. And that mandatory training is often a conference in which they are being um, shown a lot of videos and they're getting a lot of lectures and everyone is there, no matter whether they care or not about this issue. So what we've done is we've layered ECHO on top of this. And these are volunteers within the police departments who have raised their hand and chosen to become crisis intervention experts. And they receive ongoing case-based um, learning where they are unpacking situations that have gone terribly wrong. And what this allows them to do, which is truly um, remarkable, we almost never see this in our professional context, is they are learning from their failures and they are learning from mistakes. And they are exposing their vulnerabilities to one another and they are asking and advising one another in a truly open-hearted and open-minded fashion. Very different from the kind of mandatory training that they receive alongside. So this is simply a powerful illustration of what is different about ECHO. So what we're trying to do is create a cross-cutting system of knowledge that brings together, and you don't have to do ECHO for every disease that may afflict your community. We're talking about the Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule of picking the 20 most common, most complex conditions that may be prevalent in your community and targeting those for 80% of the impact, but ultimately creating a cross-cutting uh, cross knowledge sharing model that brings together community health centers and your State Department of Health so that no matter where a patient may get care, they are getting the same quality of care regardless of where they live. So this is another nice example of that this, these are our integrated addiction and psychiatry sites where patients can get access to opiate addiction um, through buprenorphine um, prescription and, and care. And this shows how, um, to use a cliche, ECHO can bend the curve. These, this is a graph of um, minority and poverty-stricken um, zip codes. And it shows how once ECHO was introduced um, our New Mexico curve really began to change, whereas the other curve is across the United States. This is the, um, some of you are engaged, in fact, in this powerful demonstration project, our national opioid echo with five different hubs, uh, all 
providing very similar um, didactics and curriculum and enabling a huge number of participants across the state, behavioral health providers, medical providers, to um, engage with them and learn and get all kinds of um, uh, credits and expand access to care. We do think that the care team needs to be um, um, expanded, that we need to embrace community health workers and other less traditional members of the care team. But again, they must be properly trained, supported, enabled, and mentored. We can't, whether it's a physician or a community health worker or a community nurse, train people up, send them out, and expect that that will be sufficient for them to manage not only their general practice community, but also the patients of extreme complexity. We've even brought this into the prisons. These are prison peer educators who are becoming experts in um, uh, hand washing, tattooing, safe practices, and teaching each other effectively as peer, uh, you know, peer to peer mentors, how to reduce HCV infection and sexually transmitted diseases in their community. This is their graduation ceremony. So ECHO really is a system-wide intervention. It's not a just add water. It's not an instant fix. It takes work and time to um, produce its powerful effects across a region or healthcare system. But what we're seeing is um, not only what I would call slow food impacts, right? Local relevant knowledge, leverage to address local problems in a appropriate community-based fashion, but also fast food effects, because sometimes we simply need to get a lot of information to a wide variety of providers very quickly. Think Ebola, think H1N1. In New Mexico, we've used our ECHO network to um, address a number of outbreaks very quickly and very effectively. But ultimately, you see here that we're talking about this term of a force multiplier, that we know that our community can't be properly taken care of by the capacity that exists now. So we have to expand capacity by thinking differently how we're enabling care to be provided. So again, this is us. I am currently sitting right there in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, these this is a lovely, um, although somewhat out of date, I forgot to switch this slide. Uh, it's even more colorful now. These are, you can see how whether you live in some far corner of New Mexico, you may have access to um, some specialty care or in some cases a wide variety of specialty care enabled through the ECHO ongoing model. This is the VA application of ECHO 9, um, uh, Echo Hub sites providing 26 kinds of echo expertise across 600 community based outpatient clinics, including some really unusual and rare diseases. And I know that we're going to talk today with your panel about echo in some unusual contexts, but they even have an echo for transgender elder veterans. Army and Navy have applied it in pain. This is a, a, a program management and best practices in the community ECHO um, run by the CDC, where the CDC is using ECHO to train community intervention specialists, all trying to reduce obesity rates in Native communities. So the cases here aren't patients, but they are communities and the interventions that are being applied to change the game in obesity and cancer. ECHO hub growth is truly exponential. This is um, a credit to all of you who have come to the table and found ECHO, as one of you said, the best thing since sliced bread. It is when it's applied in the right place, right? When it's applied for that ECHO sweet spot of great complexity. And uh, these are our ECHO hubs all around the world. Many of you can find your names there and the ECHO super hubs that have graduated to become ECHO sites. Some of the um, incredible variety of applications of the ECHO model that we're seeing. I've highlighted in red some of the cancer-related ones, right? I'm just flashing them for you. They really can take your breath away when you look at them in depth. Eating disorders, I mean, just an incredible array of powerful ECHOs where experts have decided to share what they know and uh, allow others to do what they do.
ECHO is being adopted, as I said, globally. Um, we are now at almost exactly 200 hub sites, all kinds of cool applications across the world, on and on. ECHO is really spreading like wildfire across Africa, particularly in the arena of laboratory best practices. This is a QI ECHO context. These are some of our African ECHOs. I know my time is up, so I'm zoom, zoom, zooming. ECHO in cancer has been proven uh, to help us reduce the very severe disparities that exist. What we would say is that after the ECHO, uh, excuse me, after the cancer moonshot generating best practices, it's time now for an ECHO earth shot to get those best practices to everyone on earth equally and some powerful applications. This is a tumor board echo taking place in Mumbai. Um, and some really cool, these are their learners spread across 86 of the um, most expert echo sites. These are um, uh, cancer care expert sites across the country. These are the places where people come from to get care at Tata Memorial. And you see that when they're overlaid, if only we can expand access, true access to specialty care throughout India, it will change the game. I'm not gonna spend any time on the ECHO Act. It is coming to fruition and uh, the report that is mandated is going to be published in December. We hope with a very exciting results. And I will end with um, this slide. The echo works and it looks very strange on my Apple computer, I apologize, because it is using technology to enable force multiplication, knowledge expansion, and the demonopolization of knowledge. It is ultimately um, a, a community of practice that's being built and we use that term very casually in many ways, but um, you see this deeply in echo. And with that, I will um stop sharing and pass it over hopefully to all of you so we can talk so i and david are standing here with the mics if if, if you have any question please raise the hand and we can ask them to erica hi erica could you provide more detail about i echo Absolutely. I don't want to go into excruciating detail because um, that would just be boring, but um, it, please know that it's a, a useful tool. It is the only tool that's mandatory. And what it tracks um, is all of the metrics that every program, every Echo Hub would like to know. So it tracks your audience membership, how they um, evolve over time. Is it mostly nurses? Is it doctors? Is it social workers? How does that change? How many cases have been presented in each of the echoes you run? How has that changed over time? Um, it, it tracks the frequency of your sessions, how many CMEs you may be providing, all of those kinds of metrics that you need to report to your funders and your leadership and that we need to observe from the mothership to know how echo is um, evolving around the world. Yes? This, this may be kind of basic, but how does this get paid for? Oh, what a wonderful question. So um, it depends on which side you're looking at, right? We're talking about hubs and we're talking about spokes. And, and, and forgive me if that terminology seems a little um, basic. I had someone once say that she didn't want to be called a hub, she wanted to be called the echo host. So maybe that's more democratic, but the, the host organization or hub organization gets funded lots of different ways. And I hope that some of the speakers today will tell you how they get funded. We at the Echo Institute as a hub get funded through grants from our, mostly from our state legislature, but also through um, um, the um, uh, Medicaid office of our state. We get a direct allocation of PM, PM per member per month allocation from our Medicaid plan. We also have a lot of philanthropic funding that we apply to, uh, to our ECHOs. And we also have other funding largely from HRSA. Um, and, and honestly, you could name about five or six different federal funding entities that fund a lot of ECHO, HRSA being the main one. HRSA, CDC, PCORI, SAMHSA, 
Those are the biggies in the ECHO funding game. But mostly, most ECHO hubs have work to do, right? You guys are already specialists. You do a lot of work. Your job is actually to um, expand access to care, reduce disparities, and teach people things. So if you use the money you have and you layer ECHO on top of it, often it doesn't cost you almost anything. And in many cases, it actually saves you money. So we often encourage people to think about ECHO as an operating system to do the work you're already doing or supposed to be doing more effectively and more efficiently, right? You already have a community of learners that you're engaged with and often you're engaging with them in a less efficient and less effective way. You're having a lot of conferences, conferences are expensive. You may be traveling out to communities, even in a car, one by one, and working with your community of learners, but again, in fact, that extension, the ag extension model is originally where ECHO got its name. We are the extension for community healthcare outcomes. Sanjeev wanted to ramp up the power of ag extension agents that would travel out to communities and talk to farmers, right? So it's that kind of um, enabled learning that we want to do, but we want, so hubs get funded lots of ways. Spokes are currently not funded. We are hoping that the ECHO Act will create sustainable pathways so the community clinics can get compensated by pro for protecting the time of community clinicians who are learning. But the truth is, ECHO is valuable and financially viable for spoke sites as well as hub sites for lots of reasons, mostly because it reduces um, turnover and improves retention and billability of the services that community clinics can provide. And we could talk a lot about that, but I can tell you lots of ways that ECHO saves money. Thank you, Erica. Erica is going to be here uh, for throughout the session, and we will have uh, opportunity to ask her question later on. Uh, up next is UVA um, talking about uh, Project Echo setup, and uh, so Kim. I am Kim Albero. I am a doctor of nursing practice student at the University of Virginia, and the program manager for Project Echo um, through APN Place, which is an advanced practice nursing preceptor placement program that works with several different um, schools of nursing and clinical sites around the state. Um, and the reason I include you know, both of those things is that my doctoral research deals with tracking some of those outcomes, the pre and post survey, um, information about starting an ECHO and having people participate in ECHO. Uh, so that's me. So we are doing a 10 week pilot program and our clinical area of focus is vascular disease, which is kind of a big topic. It's all encompassing. Um, and we intended it to be that way so that we could include many different specialists uh, because specialist time is valuable and scarce. And um, we wanted to be able to include people who could talk about peripheral vascular disease, stroke, um, heart failure even, so we have a lot of different topics that are um, covered. APN Place is funded by HRSA, and this project as a part of APN Place is benefiting from the HRSA funding. Um, I am not privy to all of the details of how that came to be, but um, I'll let you know that we have HRSA funding to do this APN Place. I'm sorry, to do this Project ECHO. So. Um, the goals of our Project ECHO are very similar to what you'll hear from all different ECHOs around uh, the region and around the country, um, and as Erica touched on, our goal mainly is to increase the primary care provider confidence and knowledge in managing patients with this particular disease process. Um, we really want to establish a supportive learning environment where primary care providers are comfortable speaking with specialists, speaking with one another, and hearing from other, um, not just specialists, but other types of providers that are out in the state, kind of comparing notes on what's available where. And ultimately, we want to make sure that we make these very strong connections between specialists and community providers so that they are comfortable managing patients in their community setting and then referring when they need to. So the first thing that we did to get started 
was put out a needs assessment to the providers who we were hoping to recruit to um, participate in Project ECHO. And based on the needs assessment, we were able to come up with some areas of interest and some topics of interest that the providers themselves said they wanted to learn more about. Um, these are those areas, they included some clinical questions and then some questions about community resources around the state. Um, and this was a really important thing because what we didn't want to do was have people giving talks about things that our community providers were already aware of, comfortable with, didn't feel they needed additional information about. So based on the needs assessment and who we had available to give talks, um, here's a brief list of what we talked about, um, the topics that we came up with, and then some of the providers. So you'll see kind of a myriad of titles there. We have nurse practitioners, we have um, a social worker, we have a pharmacologist who's going to be giving a talk next week, um, and then we have several other MD specialists that have different areas of um, specialty. Some are neurologists who talk about stroke treatment, some are heart failure specialists, um, but it was a large group, um, including one of our <laughs> participants in this talk, um, but a large group of different people who are able to provide a didactic session that in, is essentially a grand rounds type presentation. It's pretty brief, about 20 to 30 minutes, but it covers a topic that the provider, the specialist provider, tailors to the primary care setting. So instead of doing the, you know, in-depth, here's how we treat this in the hospital, they talk about if you see a patient like this in your setting, here's what we need you to do before, they send, before you send them to us. Or in, as part of your workup, here's what we want to make sure you ask or um, address. So um, here's a quick picture of just some of our participants from one of our sessions. Um, and we are reaching providers who are down in the far southwest corner of Virginia, all the way up to northern Virginia near Washington, D.C., and then along the southern part of Virginia as well. Many of our specialists at the hub are from the University of Virginia. Um, so the 430 miles covered is the distance between the providers who have connected from the furthest sites. Um, so far we've touched 30 providers, 30 primary care providers. We've had eight students participate. Some of them are um, FNP students, so they're, they will be primary care providers within a year. Um, and some are also undergraduate nursing students, so we, we don't just teach a certain set of people. We want our, um, the democratization of knowledge. We want to reach as many people as, po as possible. Okay, so this is just a sample of our um, case-based learning presentation template. A lot of what we have comes from the ECHO Institute. That um, ECHO box that Erica talked about includes a lot of um, materials and templates for things so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and also so that we kind of standardize the way that we do case presentations um, and the way that we run ECHOs. So our ECHO um, looks like this. We have an introduction that's about three to five minutes where basically we just identify who's on the call um, and where they are. And then we have a didactic presentation which is anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. And that's done in part because we want, we record our sessions and then we are able to put out the recorded didactic information as a grand rounds type education to people who weren't able to attend. Um, and that increases our reach as well. Um, then we have a case presentation, which lasts from five to 10 minutes, where a community provider talks about a case that they've seen. Um, some of the cases that we've done have been kind of made up. <laughs> They're not specifically um, provider or patients that we've actually seen, but cases that are common. So things that we could anticipate people seeing, including details about the patient that maybe are unique to parts of different parts of Virginia. You know, we talk about whether or not people work in a mine or smoke or drink or, you know, things that kind of are similar among many different types of patients in different parts of the state. And then we spend some time talking about the case between the providers who are on the call. Um, 
providers, other community providers have the opportunity to ask questions and then um, clarify information about the case before the experts chime in with their recommendations for how to manage that patient. Okay, so this was the first um, echo that we've done at UVA um, for this area and for this topic. And so I just have a couple recommendations here about how to even get started with recruiting, um, with getting your hub together, <laughs> um, because it does take a big team of people and a lot of coordination of schedules. Um, Erica talked about the you know, protection of time. Our community providers don't have a lot of time in their day. So we need to pick a time that's good for a lot of people, which sometimes involves finding out if people have an academic day or a day that has protected time, um, or even just a lunch hour consistently. Um, so we have planned our echoes for Thursdays um, during the lunch hour. We actually do it from one to two which allows our providers with clinical schedules to look out ahead of the time that they are currently scheduled and block off times to be able to participate. Um, we had a wonderful network of community providers already in place with APN Place, and um, I recommend that if you're looking to recruit those community providers, Casting the net wide, you know, contact as many people as you can and tell them to tell their friends. Um, we sent out a, an invitation and that included a Google calendar reminder for people, and we said, forward this to people, forward this to other community providers, um, and have them, you know, join in. Also, establishing that schedule of, of your specialists is important. Um, because you want to make sure that you're on their schedule, they remember that they're going to do this for you, um, and that they're prepared to do it, because um, no one wants to show up and then not have the speaker be there. And then additionally, putting out the schedule ahead of time allows the community providers to see something they definitely want to attend and put it on their schedule as well. I'm impatient, there you go. We also put out some um, flyers and some email information. We emailed was our main method of communication. Um, but this is just an example of one of the flyers that's available through the um, ECHO Institute. And of course, it has special information about the University of Virginia. But just to kind of help introduce people to ECHO as a concept. I recently attended a meeting where I was introduced as the stroke ECHO person. And it wasn't until 40 minutes into the meeting that I realized everyone wanted to hear about using ECHO the machine in stroke, and I said, well, that's not really my area of expertise. I'm not, I don't do echocardiograms, I don't do echo, um, I do extension of community health outcomes. So even just getting that piece of information to people so they don't think that they're doing cardiology when in fact we're trying to teach them about a different clinical area um, is important. And the uh, Echo Institute has a lot of great links that has videos and information um, that you can put out that so you don't have to recreate the story for people. Um, and these are just some ideas. As we've worked through this particular clinic um, with vascular disease, we've gotten feedback from community providers and then just from other people at the university, other providers who are specialists and who are interested in helping and doing an echo of their own. Um, so these are just a couple examples of topics that people are interested in learning about, um, topics that have funding available through um, the state and through other organizations. Um, so these are things that we're looking to do in the future. And I think that's all the information I have, but um, do we want to take questions now? Oh, so thank you. Yeah. Sorry, thank you guys. Perfect timing, thank you. We will try to keep the uh, question and answer at the, uh, at the last. Uh, we, have, we are trying to set up for a mini echo session right now. Um, so we'll start from there. Uh, in the meanwhile, you guys can ask uh, Kim questions if you want to. So I'm with a community health center on the Eastern Shore of Virginia, and if our providers wanted to participate in something like this, how would they get involved? 
Um, well, I will be happy to send information. We can connect and then I can um, send information out to those providers. Most of our communication happens through email. So what I do is I send a, a meeting invitation and then that schedule out to any interested community providers. Um, and as the program manager, I do a lot of trying to get people to show up. <laughs> so I would love to cast my net even further and be able to include people who are definitely interested. Um, and a lot of times people are interested, they just don't have the time in their clinical schedule because um, we have to have it at the same time each week in order for people to schedule it. Yeah, well like you said, I think if you know in advance and can block schedules. So. Absolutely, yep. All right, thank you, Kim. Um, so. So very briefly, we're gonna, um, I think um, we have already covered anatomy of teleecho clinic and thank you Kim for doing that. I'll just very briefly go over what happens in teleecho clinic in next one and a half minutes and see how that goes. Uh, it's a good habit to uh, do a, a brief planning huddle before the session, um, uh, generally 5, 10 to 15 minutes before just to uh, understand the sequence, get the tech working and, and uh, kind of go over the cases uh, as a hub team. Um, then we do introduction, uh, video participants, uh, telephone participants, and hub and in-person participants, and we ask them to introduce themselves. Um, uh, we then we do announcement just to uh, review the agenda, uh, get reminders how to mute, unmute, uh, and get friendly with the technology and some etiquettes, uh, and then follow up from the prior clinic. Um, do a brief didactic, and it depends on the uh, type of echo session we are running. Uh, it can be from 10 minutes to 30 minutes, depending on uh, what kind of clinic you're running. Uh, and the, this is the opportunity to provide CMA credits. Uh, and then become, starts the case presentation. Um, the hub facilitator introduces the presenter. Uh, spoke presenter presents the case. Facilitator invites other team members at spoke to comment, elaborate on the case, hub facilitator summariz summarizes the presentation, and hub facilitator ensures with the uh, presenter the summary is accurate. Um, hub asks audience for clarifying question to make sure everybody feels involved. Um, no recommendation for diagnosis or treatment at this point. It is very important so that we can uh, preserve um, um, understanding and encourage participation. Uh, video participants then tell, uh, first we ask video participants to participate for, ask for clarifying qualifications and then for telephone participants and then hub participants. And then um, facilitator, it's a big job for facilitator to facilitate these sessions, uh, kind of draws out, draw, draws out comments for all participants. And then hub ask audience for recommendation and impression. Um, and diagnosis or further workup, non-pharmacological, -pharm and it's very important to kind of see this. This is structured in a good way, where you're talking about the non-pharmacological, pharmacological, and interventional recommendations, and uh, facilitator draws out comments from all participants again, so facilitator has a big job here. Um, Hub summarizes the recommendation and con uh, consensus of diagnosis and treatment plan, and uh, inform the presenter that the written recommendation will be also, so many, uh, Echo hubs provide a recommendation, either email or fax, to the uh, to the spoke sites. And then closing announcement: always encourage uh, submission of case presentations for future cl uh, for future clinics. Um, encourage completion of evaluation forms and uh, post clinic debrief to make sure what went well, what did not go well. So it is a ten a ten step process, uh, and um, it works really really well. So with that, um, we'll try to run a mini echo session here right now. Case presentation, we have Erica uh, fr uh, from New University of New Mexico acting as the spoke, and Nana Funana from VCU uh, as another spoke. And we have the hub here. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, so welcome to our mini echo session. So um, we'll start with introductions from our hub team here. My name's Amanda Bennett. I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I'm serving as the facilitator for today. Hi, I'm Aggie Erickson. I'm director of Project Echo at the Weizmann Institute, and here I'm a licensed clinical social worker and the behavioral health specialist. 
I'm Rosalyn Stewart. I'm an internal medicine pediatric provider at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and today I am the subject matter expert for the Echo Hub. Hi, I'm Kim Albero. I am a family nurse practitioner, primary care provider from the University of Virginia, um, acting as another primary care provider to uh, provide input. Okay, and if we could get um, introductions from our spokes. I'm trying to read names. Um, is it Nana? Yes, hi. I'm Nana Fofana. I am with VCU. Welcome, thank you. And then Erica. Hello, my name is Erica Harding and I will be a nurse practitioner for today's session. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so and Erica is going to be presenting our case today. Um, so Erica, take it away. Wonderful. So I'm going to share my screen. So um, we are seeing this gentleman. He is an 81 year old gentleman who lives at home, although as I'll explain, he's had a few falls and he's now temporarily in a long term care facility. Um, we've only been seeing him for a short amount of time, but I'm, I'm really hoping to get some advice concerning some of his medications and how we can help him. So this gentleman is widowed. He's a veteran. His family is out of town and he doesn't have a, a social network, no close friends. He does not use alcohol and he's a non-smoker. Um, so, so that's great and somewhat different from many of our um, veterans. Now he came to our clinic on methadone and we switched him over to Norco and uh, then we put him on a fentanyl patch and now he is on the fentanyl patch and Norco. So if um, in terms of knowing exactly what his um, drug dosages are, his uh, prescriptions are, let me find that for you. You can see here he's um, He's on 50 mics of fentanyl and five 325s three times daily of Norco. Um, we are trying to get him to um, only be on Tylenol and ibuprofen. His problems, he does have a lot of pain and, and he's really struggling because he has such degenerative disease in his back. He has um, arthritis affecting multiple joints hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's been diagnosed with depression. Um, and what we know is he's become um, a pretty serious fall risk. He's had two substantial falls, one resulting in a wrist being broken and now a head injury. And the head injury is what has currently put him in the long-term care facility. He also, ha he also has osteoporosis and GERD. So we're really interested in getting your help, right? Getting him off of um, the Norco, the fentanyl. We were thinking that first we would start with the fentanyl and, and wean him down and then reduce the Norco. But honestly, we don't really know exactly um, what approach to take and would greatly appreciate your advice. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, so I'm gonna take one minute just to summarize the case for all of our participants. Um, Erica, please correct me if I got anything incorrect. So this is an 81-year-old gentleman with um, history of chronic arthritis, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, GERD, and depression. Um, no known substance abuse history, but presented to your clinic relatively recently on methadone, switched to Norco, and then fentanyl patch added. Um, and most recently, um, you found that he's been doubling up on his Norco dose, so getting 10 and 650 three times a day plus the fentanyl um, and has a, had a couple of recent falls, so had a wrist fracture and then most recently was admitted to a skilled care facility because of a head injury after his last fall and you're looking for guidance on how to safely and effectively wean his opioids. So um, what we're gonna do now is open it up for any um, clarifying questions from first from our virtual participants. Anybody have any clarifying questions they'd like to ask Erica? So Nana, do you have any questions for the group? No, okay. I was just gonna say in terms of family, there's no one at all, right? Is that correct? Yeah, unfortunately there's no one there to take care of him and we've been very frustrated. We haven't found any better resources for him in the community than unfortunately placing him 
somewhat against his will in the long-term care facility. Our hope is that we, if we can reduce his fall risk by reducing you know, this high dosing of, of opiates that maybe he'll be safe enough to return home. Thank you. Um, I wanna ask for clarifying questions from our team as well. Thank you. As a behavioral health specialist, I am actually quite concerned about his isolation and dealing with depression. Um, it sounds like he has no social support. He's very isolated. So actually, I have three questions. One, any previous substance misuse uh, in his past? That's one. Um, secondly, what is a day in his life is look like? Uh, what does he do at home? Is he active? Does he walk? Is he laying on the couch all day? What do we know about that? And then um, finally, is he currently engaged in any behavioral health therapy? Wonderful questions. We don't know if he's had an opiate uh, abuse history. Um, he, he denies such. We also do agree with you that he's very isolated and very lonely. And my guess is that he describes his day very differently than we might describe his day. So I wish we could in our small community think of some better resources between these two extremes of him living alone by himself unsupported or the long-term care facility, which may not be um, ideal. We would love some suggestions. Uh, great. Um, if there are no more clarifying questions, I want to address the um, opiate use um, issues. I, it's very concerning that he's now falling and that he's doubling up on the Norco. Um, I find it very concerning that um, taking 650 of Tylenol three times a day or more um, will put him at the really upper limits of what's recommended for Tylenol. So instead, um, Erica, of weaning down on the fentanyl first, I actually would make sure uh, the first step is to go to the Norco one tablet three times a day first and keep him there for at least for a couple of weeks. I think the weans need to be slow because he is of geriatric age, he's 81, and so we don't wanna do anything very quickly. Once you're on Norco one tablet three times a day, I think the next step appropriately would be to wean off the fentanyl. And we prefer to do about a 25% reduction. Um, and for him, I would do it no more quickly than every two to three weeks. So the first step down for his fentanyl would be to go from a 50 microgram patch to two patches, one that's 25 micrograms and one that's 12 and a half microgram patch and leave those on for two to three weeks and then take another step down. Thank you very much. Um, okay, um, so thank you for recommendations. Any, um, any additional thoughts, comments, recommendations from um, any of our participants? Um, my suggestion would just be as a patient transition, we should remember to add some home health services, you know, to help him through that, especially with social support, as that would help him in recovery. Great. So to summarize, and then we'll open up for last minute comments. So um, first recommendation from a medication standpoint would be to wean the Norco dose first, get to safe Tylenol dosing um, as the primary goal, and then begin to wean the fentanyl gradually every two to three weeks, um, and also really start to explore home health services that could um, be a support during the transition from skilled nursing back to his home environment. Um, just open it up for any last minute comments or questions from the team before this echo session closes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. This was really a wonderfully run um, echo session. So please, again, give it up for this panel. Let me invite Aggie Erickson. Uh, from Weizmann Institute to talk about and Mandy Lamb. So hi everyone, I'm Aggie Erickson. I'm director of Project ECHO at the Weizmann Institute and with me is... Mandy Lamb, I'm the program manager of our Project ECHO program. So we appreciate this opportunity to be here with you. So we are super excited to share our experience as a primary care-based uh, Project ECHO as we are making a difference um, in rural and underserved areas across the country. 
So a little bit about us, who are we? The Weizmann Institute is a research and innovation arm of a large federally qualified health center out of Connecticut. Um, we've been focusing on improving the primary care and its delivery for underserved patient population in rural and urban areas. And we are doing this with research, innovation, and uh, training the next generation of healthcare leaders and health professionals. About the community health center, so again, the Weizmann Institute is a program of the community health center. The health center um, started in 1972, so all the work that we are doing is grounded in 45 years of, of experience uh, delivering comprehensive primary care, medical, behavioral health, and dental services. And we do so in Connecticut in over 200 locations. Uh, 14 of those are uh, large health centers. Uh, many of them are schools. We have over 60 school-based health centers. And we also deliver care uh, at homeless shelters, emergency shelters, and domestic violence shelters. Uh, we care for about um, 145,000 patients annually, and um, the three foundational pillars are clinical excellence, research and development, and training the next generation. So why did we start doing Project ECHO? As um, historically, saying historically, um, everybody is, uh, Project ECHO hubs are done by academic health centers. So the story is that um, in June of 2011, when Dr. Aurora um, published the article in the New England Journal of Medicine, our chief medical officer was reading about it and visited with Dr. Aurora right after the article was published and uh, said, well, this is exactly what we want. We need this for our primary care providers. One is to reduce the variation in care that exists um, and also to improve access to specific uh, care that can be safely and effectively managed in primary care with support from specialists. So he was super excited. He came back to Connecticut and there was no academic health center at that time. And again, this is 2011. Um, when um, so academic health centers were no, not interested at the time. So our leadership was super um, excited about and very innovative, um, saying, well, why can't we be a hub? So with that, we became uh, a Project ECHO hub um, in the end of 2011, and our first Project ECHO that was officially kicked off in June, uh, or I'm sorry, January of 2012. So within six months, we had our ECHO up and running. And what we aim to do is not only to provide access to ECHO um, to our providers, uh, serving patients across uh, Connecticut, but also to remove um, geographic boundaries, making geography irrelevant, and really offer Project ECHO access to anybody who is interested in learning um, and being part of our learning community. Because, you know, even though there were some echoes, not everybody was focusing on the same conditions. So uh, we welcome anybody who wanted to be part of our uh, learning network. We started with hepatitis C and HIV in the first year. And uh, with that, what we hope to accomplish was to, out of the 14 sites, we only had three practices where we had hep C and HIV specialists. And that was really not um, the way we wanted to provide patient-centered medical care. We wanted to have access to hep C and HIV treatment at all our health centers. So with the ECHO model and embracing the ECHO, we have done that uh, successfully. So, you know, what you do with this is, this is also eliminating stigma. Our patients still... You know, uh, there's still a lot of stigma around HIV um, when patients have to go to an HIV clinic and when they go to primary care, um, you know, they're at, at their medical home, so no one really knows why they're there. Um, and again, these can be uh, safely and effectively managed in primary care. But very quickly as we started uh, early on, we were focused on what other um, topics can we focus on and should we focus on? Because there are so many topics that you can think of that you can do echo, but uh, there is not enough time in a day if, uh, for, if everybody wanted to join every ECHO, then you would just join ECHO and you'd never see a patient. So we were looking at what are the hotspots of the communities that we serve. So sorry with hep C HIV, but then certainly um, the opioid epidemic, that's a public health emergency, a public health crisis. This is, we, this is where we need all hands on deck. So we started uh, with chronic pain and buprenorphine uh, in January of 2013. Um, and then 
Um, we also have another echo focused on complex integrated pediatrics. And one is that a little bit unique, um, a complex care management that is focused on the nurses. Uh, because many of the health centers already have some value-based purchasing and contracts, uh, but we're really hoping that it is really truly coming and it will make a big difference. But we really need our nurses to be prepared and be ready to know how to do complex care coordination. So, um, the complex care management not only builds their skills, but also helps uh, um, build their knowledge, but they also build their leadership skills, um, as well as how to be effectively uh, managing relationships in the communities. And one echo that it's not up there is we had an LGBT echo, which was funded by CDC and in collaboration with NAC, which um, was quite successful. And now we're looking for funding to bring it back up when it's, it's a UDS measure for health centers. So, um, and it's a huge challenge for many of the health centers. Those 10 that were part of the pilot, uh, they were considered as already far ahead on the road and they had plenty of challenges uh, themselves. So just can imagine uh, what's um, in front of uh, everyone else that have not done much work um, in LGBT care. This is a map showing our uh, reach providing Project ECHO for over six years. Um, we have reached and supported 304 practices. We have delivered 739 ECHO sessions, over 2,500 uh, complex patient case presentations. And uh, in terms of the reach, it's 33 states plus Puerto Rico and DC. And the breakdown of the participants, 775 medical providers, 298 behavioral health providers, and 296 care team members. So when we have, when we recruit, um, uh, practices to join Project ECHO, we not only recruit the medical providers, but the, med the behavioral health providers and care team members as well. That's quite critical, especially when you're looking to address uh, like epidemic and uh, pain and buprenorphine. You, you, you have to have the behavioral health partners around the tables to really provide a patient-centered care. Um, and what we also have learned is that while ECHO is really fantastic and it's beautiful, it's, uh, we have been accompanying with other tools as well uh, because we, what we have learned is we need to provide multiple resources for the providers, not just, not just one way. So ECHO, it's build a knowledge over time. Um, you bring your most challenging and complex cases. Uh, we also embrace the uh, e-consults. They're, those are quick, secure messages from primary care to providers to the specialist who gives an advice and guidance within 48 business hours. And why we need that is because there's not enough time to address all the cases during echo sessions. So what happens with those who did not submit their cases or the cases were not so quite challenging to be submitted through echo or you have a provider that, you know, you're 80% sure, but you're not 100% sure. So you can do so uh, via e-consultations. And then we have, um, for every ECHO, we have a website, which Mendy is going to talk about it. But I think it's another key and a very important element is a practice improvement collaborative. There is a lot of wonderful, really best practices that are taught during ECHO, but many of the practices are not ready to embr embrace the, those. Their system is not set up to implement best practices. So we have developed practice improvement collaboratives to work with frontline teams um, and to train quality improvement coaches. So those uh, best practices can be implemented um, in the primary care setting. And now I'm passing on to Mandy. Thank you, Augie. And I'll go quick because I know we have four minutes uh, left, but this is just an example of one of our echo sessions. Um, and this is just an example of uh, our faculty comes from within our health centers, our own primary care providers, but we also have expert faculty. Um, this is our pain faculty and they're from uh, Arizona and they're from the, El they're sitting in El Rio Health Center, who's one of our partners and attends a lot of our ECHO sessions, but uh, they have over uh, several decades of experience treating pain patients. Um, and as Augie mentioned, we have uh, websites for uh, our various uh, ECHO programs, and this is our PainNet uh, website, which is, houses all of our ECHO sessions, but it also houses um, various tools that providers can go in uh, to, to look up and uh, use um, for any questions they have while treating their pain patients. Uh, we have uh, blogs on this website where different uh, specialists go and uh, 
post different topics. We have discussion boards, we have knowledge bursts, we have short video clips on how to treat uh, various conditions. And this is just one example of uh, one of our sites, well, or two of our sites on our website. Again, you can see where we have uh, assessment tools stored, different resources. Uh, we have multiple disciplines uh, on our website that folks can reference. Um, so moving on from sort of uh, the different tools we have for our primary care providers, uh, at the Weizmann Institute, we um, also have a large research team that can help us um, analyze and evaluate ECHO, which is a, an important component of sustainability. Uh, so this is one of our articles uh, on our pain ECHO that was uh, recently published, and we're working on other manuscripts and other evaluations uh, to sort of bolster why ECHO is important in primary care settings. And I'll go talk briefly about that. So this is just uh, one uh, analysis that we're currently, several researchers are working on at the Weizmann Institute where uh, we did a content analysis, a qualitative study on um, the different um, recommendations that came up in our cases for our pain echo. And I'll just talk about it briefly, but we'll be speaking more about this uh, in a Tuesday morning session um, on our our approach to the opioid epidemic. Uh, but again, on our pain echo sessions, we talk a lot about the CDC best practices, but also there's other themes and topics that come up in the case presentations. Um, we studied 66 case presentations and analyzed the feedback um, from that our specialists gave, and we found that 40% of the time, the issues that arose were uh, psychosocial, which is incredibly important to understand. This surprises no one, but um, again, we, we move, go beyond just what the CDC best practices uh, recommends. The next slide. Again, uh, we, okay, we're at zero minutes, but we'll talk about this more on Tuesday morning. This is some more analysis, and this is the last slide, and these are some of the successes and challenges we've had on our ECHO session. Um, again, we're primary care based, so we are well aware of the challenges uh, that our primary care folks are up against. Um, again, we have a large research team that supports um, the evaluation of our ECHO, and then um, we've been able to take this national, making geography irrelevant and extending it uh, nationally. Challenges we have, which I'm sure other folks uh, who will speak today can speak to as well, is sustainability, finding funding to provide these services, um, provider time is uh, very limited, as we've mentioned before. Um, and then just the current healthcare environment, which again, fee-for-service, um, you know, the, the focus on visits and, you know, the current infrastructure uh, sometimes creates barriers in terms of translating knowledge into care. So I'll leave it at that and we'll take questions uh, after. Thank you. Thank you, Aggie and Mandy. What a wonderful talk. Uh, next up, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Rosalind Stewart uh, from John Hopkins to talk. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the echo, one of the echoes we have at Johns Hopkins. Um, it's a little different than, say, um, hepatitis C in that sickle cell disease is considered a rare disease. There's only about 100,000 individuals in the United States with sickle cell disease, and um, like all echoes, the idea is to help people with the disease get access to high quality care. So we're funded in two ways. We have a HRSA grant that um, helped us uh, kick off our ECHO, and we have some private philanthropic funding, which also helps support our ECHO mission. And so where we are now, we started in 2015, so we're about three years in. We've reached a total of 185 providers, and um, overall, we've increased provider confidence in treating sickle cell disease, and most importantly, we've established a learning community where you can have that um, sharing of knowledge and that free flow of ideas that is so important for the success of ECHO. This is our expert panel. This is who sits at our hub. We have both pediatric and adult sickle cell experts. I'm actually not a sickle cell provider. I'm a primary care provider, and my area of expertise is in um, care coordination and resource management, so how to get high-quality care for lower costs 
those are the things that I do. We have um, a pain and psychiatry expert to help us with our opiate and addiction and other behavioral issues, as well as community health worker and um, um, social workers that participate. So our menu, our, um, how our echo goes, is also maybe a little different than other echoes. We have case introductions. Uh, we have introductions and then we have our first case that um, in general is about 30 minutes between um, pre presenting the case and the case discussion. Our didactic is in the middle and it is somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes of didactic. And um, then we have a second case. Our echo runs for a little over an hour, somewhere between an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and 25 minutes, uh, depending on, on the length of our case discussion. And we talk about many different things, um, everything from the um, medical, um, physiologic aspects of sickle cell disease, including like iron overload, how do you take care of acute chest syndrome, so some of the, the um, things that you see when you take care of a patient with sickle cell disease. We talk a lot about pain management, how do you convert um, between morphine and fentanyl, and how do you do other things like that, but also bigger picture things. How do you help patients deal with the stigma that they re receive when they go to various um, care providers that might not treat them as well as somebody who understands the disease as well. What is, um, how, how as a provider can you have better um, motivational interviewing skills and have better um, behavioral outcomes uh, if we can improve our skills as providers. So, so overall, we've had 98 uh, clinics. We are about once weekly. We do take hiatuses for holidays and uh, occasional snowstorm, we might not have an echo. Um, we've given 123, we, we've meet for 100, about 123 hours total. We've awarded 196 CME hours total. Um, we've had 95 different didactics by 14 individuals. So that's the other key is it's not always a member of our hub that um, gives a didactic. Sometimes we have some of our spokes members who are um, uh, jazzed about a topic and will be one of our presenters. Uh, we've presented 175 cases of 159 unique patients. That's also important when you have such complex individuals. We might revisit a case after a few months to check in on, on the progress of that individual and make sure that the care plans don't need to be tweaked. We have now 50 spokes. And um, if you're familiar with ECHO, that's nearly about spoke saturation. So our next big frontier is we want to move to being just a hub to a super hub and help some of our um, partners, academic partners who also are taking care of sickle cell disease, start their own um, sickle hub so that spokes have more of a potpourri of choices about which uh, hub could they attend. We also have a wide variety of people who attend. It's not just uh, physicians. We have many advanced practice providers, nurses, but also social workers, community health workers, pharmacists, geneticists, anybody who's interested in learning more about delivering high quality care to the individual with sickle cell disease. We welcome them all. And many of our spokes, it's multiple people from the clinic location um, that is participating. This is our reach so far. It's a map of the United States. It's a little pale. The blue dots that are out there in the ocean really are out there in the ocean. We have participants from the Caribbean that join us. We have people from many places in the United States. At Johns Hopkins, we're mostly in the, on the eastern shore. So much of our reach is on the eastern shore. And if you blow up um, on the northeast region, you can see it, even in Maryland, we have many different sites. Um, and our exp expanding um, multiple sites in multiple cities. That's how you get our 50 hubs. Our attendance over time has grown exponentially. And so for people who are starting an ECHO, this is the most exciting thing. We started with us and one or two spokes, and it was hard. It was hard to expand, but then it just keeps expanding, and word of mouth is huge. 
And, and so now we really do have 50 hubs. So probably each week we have between 15 and 20 participants, which is, I think, appropriate number not to be oversaturated with conversation so that you can have that free flow of ideas that is necessary. How do we recruit? Primarily by word of mouth. So anybody who wants to join a Sickle Echo, come see me. I'll tell you how it's done. Uh, we'd love to have people. Every time we go give a talk, we have flyer, flyers, although I don't have one with me today. We have gone on the road. We've gone all over the Northeast region and give grand rounds about sickle cell disease. In our last 10 minutes, we talk about our sickle echo so that people can appreciate the beauty of echo and hopefully get recruit people who are interested in coming. And so we get clinic providers, hospitalists, emergency department providers. It doesn't really matter. Anybody who touches a sickle cell patient, we want. And then also academically, because we are academically minded, we've published articles talking about our echo, and then we're in things that people read. So we've actually gotten a whole bunch of spokes from all over. Um, by having an, an interview type article in the ACP Hospitalist. So if you're an internist, then it's a magazine that you get if you're a member of the ACP. And people, we had, how do you contact us at the end of that? And people contacted us to join. That's an example of our ACP Hospitalist article. So instead of a flyer, I put it on the slide. This is information about our echo. Every Wednesday at 1 o'clock Eastern time, we have our sickle cell echo. And if you're interested, please contact Bailey House. That's our echo coordinator. Um, her email is very simple, baileyhouse at jhmi, stands for Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions, edu. We'd love to have people. We will help grow. Um, our challenges are probably the same challenges that everybody has, right? And um, getting the spokes, having spoke recruitment, although I can tell you it feels great now to have that not be such a huge problem because we frequently, we have 15 to 20 participants each time. But for the first year and a half, we would only have like four people we were talking to. And, and that slide that Erica showed us earlier where we're going from one to many one to many, it just didn't seem like we were hitting that many. But I can tell you that knowledge replication happens over time. And none of this is uh, instantaneous su success. But through perseverance and over time, we have reached many. And I know we are changing lives for the better. Our other um, problem, and, and perhaps it's not always the same um, with different cases, is preventer presenter shyness. So when we have new hubs, they, they will be a voyeur. They will come and listen, and they will not present. We do have forms, just like Erica had when we went over our mock echo, about um, helping people know how to present a, a case and then what data that we're interested in. But it takes a long time for somebody to develop the courage to present. And as the spoke, the first time someone presents, celebrate that joy, right, and be kind. Um, we have lots of success. Um, the last column is our percent change from, be, from our beginning of our echo. And mind you, most of our, our spokes are hematologists. So there's people with a lot of a priori knowledge of sickle cell disease, and they've improved their comfort level in almost every um, case. Or one example we have up there is recognizing indications of hydroxyurea, which is the one, well, one of two FDA-approved um, medications for sickle cell. They already knew that. That's good. But we talk about other things about hydroxyurea. Our successes, um, we started off with a formal agreement. Like, we had a spoke that we knew we're gonna, was going to show up so that we didn't have an empty screen in the beginning, and that was very helpful. Um, we're very responsive to the spokes' needs. So if we know what they want to learn about, we're going to make sure we have a didactic about that. We offer CME. We have a great community of care. And then just like their web portals, you now have easy access to a team of providers. 
So I get calls sometimes to talk to random providers in random parts of the United States to help make sure that the sickle patient in that hospital is getting high quality care. Lastly, what are we doing next? So we've got to figure out um, the polling feature, which is part of, um, I'm looking at somebody who's going to help me, part, part of the Zoom that we've not used um, so far. And the main reason is we want to start, we're going to start giving MOC credit um, for ECHO participation. So you'll get two things, both CME or CEUs, depending on the type of provider you are, and MOC credit if you're an MD provider. We want to increase the spoke case presentation rate, so somehow figure out help with those shy nerves about presentation, and continue recruitment so that when we, as a super hub, have other hubs start, they have a base of spokes to start with, so it's not quite so hard in the beginning. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. This was such an amazing presentation. And uh, sickle cell is such a niche. Um, and uh, VCU is very excited to also join uh, sickle cell um, hub team uh, as a clinical expert. Um, so next up is uh, Krieger, uh, Kennedy Krieger, uh, Dr. Harrison. OK, I just need some slides. I can talk off the top of my head, but slides are good. Great. Um, so I'm Joyce Harrison. I'm sadly missing my partner, Mary Leppert, who's, my, who's the co-PI of this project. Um, we were on the road yesterday, too, and I think she's a little bit under the weather. But um, I want to talk a little bit about Kennedy. Um, how, OK, this is the slide advance. So um, Kennedy Krieger is a rehab hospital. It's really kind of unique. It specializes in treating children with dis developmental disabilities. Um, we are, I am faculty at Hopkins. We are part of Hopkins, but we are our own separate entity as a rehab hospital. And I think what's unique about Kennedy is its focus on developmental disabilities. So um, our project is called the Network for Early Childhood uh, Telehealth. And we have a really tiny focus, which is children between the ages of zero and six with behavioral, emotional, or developmental problems. So we span a bunch of specialties. We're, I, we're very unusual. We're the first, we were the first developmental echo. Um, and that's brought a lot of challenges. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of them. But this is a little bit about the project, uh, the problem nationally and sort of how our echo came about. But about 15% of US children have developmental disabilities. 11 to 20% of, of children have behavioral um, uh, or emotional problems, there's a huge overlap of developmental problems and behavioral and emotional problems. Um, and thir so 30 to 40 percent of kids with developmental disabilities have behavioral and emotional, co-occurring behavioral and emotional. There are very few developmental pediatricians or neurodevelopmental specialists and child psychiatrists. So all three of these specialties which address all of these problems are extremely underserved. You're going to have the pleasure of hearing from another developmental pediatrician a little bit later today about an autism uh, echo. We actually subsume autism in our echo with just about everything and anything. But um, there, are, there are just not enough of us, and there never will be, because the, the, the child psychiatry workforce is shrinking and not growing. So, um, so pediatricians are left um, managing these problems in their practices. They can't get to specialists, or there just aren't specialists. So. Um, Pediatricians are not well trained in behavioral disorders. We, we've done polls in the state of Maryland and they just don't feel equipped to deal with this stuff. And some of them just outright refuse to deal with some of this stuff. But about 40% of office visits for pediatricians, at least in the state of Maryland, and probably reflects nationally, involve some behavioral um, component. So we, know, we heard from Erica about the barriers to subspecialty care, time, waitlist, distance, time off insurance issues. So we are HRSA funded. Um, what's unique about, we, I think the reason, I, I was trying to figure out why we were here because there's all these super hubs that are doing massive stuff and we're just this, we're only a year in. We're, we're little so far but we're growing. Um, but we have a unique uh, funding and bent. So beside the topic area, um, we are HRSA funded for uh, federally, de HRSA designated rural areas and school-based health centers. So we have two d really different cohorts joining our ECHO and that's been actually um, a little bit challenging but a lot um, very, very educational and very interesting for us. So these are the HRSA designated areas and 
This is the professional, oops, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. The, profession, the mental health professional shortage areas in the state of Maryland, but I'm exited. Okay, what's going on? <laughs> I'm pressing the blind, the blind button. Okay, so here we're back. Nope, I'm just, I just pressed forward. <laughs> I'm glad I'm at a tech convention because I'm technologically challenged. No kidding. I can't believe I do these, this virtual clinic. Anyway, so these are the mental health professional shortage areas in the state of Maryland, which, as you can see, uh, is most of the state. We, so we are funded to cover the state of Maryland, but we are lucky enough to have a partner in West Virginia who is, a, again, the word of mouth that you hear about, was a friend of a friend of one of our uh, partners. So, there have been previous efforts. I was a medical director of a, a child psychiatry access project for the state of Maryland, um, and I got really frustrated because the same people were calling about the same things. They just weren't learning or using it in their practice, and this is why we um, found ECHO. We just, we, we tried a lot of stuff, and I think ECHO is the one that works. So you know that ECHO moves knowledge and not patients, and it's broader than the one-to-one. -one. So the difference between ECHO and telehealth is, you, um, Carrie's not here, but one of our one of my spokes was here today, and she said, "I have echo in my head every day as I'm seeing kids in my office now. I'm thinking about what you guys have taught me, and so it's not just that one patient that gets seen for telehealth; it's what they learn for all of those patients. So these are our partners for our echo. We have um, we have seven seven spokes right now, so we are again tiny." Um, but we reach all the way down to um, Wyoming County in West Virginia, across the state of Maryland, and over to the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, Southern Maryland is our next target. We're missing people there. Um, these are the cases. So we've had, um, we've had 41 clinics. Um, we've had about 30-something cases. Sometimes we do follow-ups, and sometimes we just do two didactics because cases, getting case presentations is a real challenge. Again, the shyness. We have one provider who's done like half our cases. She's amazing, and so the more she does, the more she wants to do. But um, I've done stuff like call people the day before clinic and say, hey, we don't have a case for tomorrow. Because Is there anyone you can think of that you could present? And that works sometimes. Um, but I also have personal relations, had personal relationships prior before with our spokes, so I don't feel uncomfortable doing that. But these are, this is what's, so our echo is targeted towards zero to six, but if a provider says, you know, I've got an 11-year-old with intellectual disability who's really functioning more like a four-year-old, can I talk about this kid? We're like, yeah, fine, great. We'll try to help you figure out what you need to do. So our case ranges have been nine months to 11 years. And these are, so we fight about what's, de what's developmental, what's behavioral, and what's emotional. So we, emotional sort of encompasses trauma. I'm actually a trauma trainer <laughs> in the state of Maryland, so trauma is one of my big um, issues that I like to uh, educate providers to think about and look for. Um, behavioral issues um, and developmental issues. We all think we own ADHD. Neurodevelopment thinks they own ADHD. Psychiatry thinks they own ADHD. So we talk a lot about ADHD. But that's just sort of the thing. We've built a curriculum of these 15-minute didactic talks that, that um, ECHO does, which we are using for all our trainees. So we're using them for pediatric trainees, psychiatry trainees, neurodevelopmental trainees. We're building this huge curriculum, which our ECHO support has allowed us to do, and we're hoping eventually to market it as a national curriculum. This is an example of, so you can see there's a really broad range of the th kinds of things we talk about, everything from developmental and behavioral comorbidities to language problems, to autism, to um, anxiety, to trauma. So we have a lot of stuff that we do. This is our spring semester. So the thing about our curriculum is we designed it as a level one through level, f level five. Basically, level one is a medical student um, level talk, so basically assuming that you don't know anything, and then level five is a specialist trainee, so my child psychiatry trainees. And what we've done in our, in our cohort is move from level twos and threes to level threes and fours, and we're finding that, th that their expertise is increasing, the sophistication of the, the discussion and the cases they're presenting is increasing. So we've had 41 clinics. We have 19 unique learners at seven different spokes. Um, we've had 209 total attendees um, and 200 CMEs. So CME is the big hook. I think um, people love getting free CMEs. And we've saved 10,000 miles based on where, where the cases are, more than 10,000 miles. And we're just a year old. We started in March of 2017. Um, the, and this, um, I think, 
what is uh, similar to what Raj showed. So we're showing that they are, this is all, this, all of the significant, and we do pre and post surveys. So they're increasing their knowledge and skills and they're increasing their confidence in treating these things in their practices, which is what ECHO is all about. And I, I am so sorry. So um, I'm, I think, how am I doing? Pretty good. Um, so <laughs> for us, it's all about the feedback we get, that are we doing what we need to do? And so this, the, these are sort of, these are quotes from our, because we're so little, it's hard for us to get stigni statistically significant data at this point, but we are growing. So what we hear is, you know, this has been so great for me. One, uh, our, our uh, spoke who presents most of the cases said, when you asked me to, we, we literally drove around the state of Maryland. I drove around to the pediatric practices I knew were in high need and the ones who were frequent callers to the line that I had directed for five years and said, you guys need to do this. This is going to be great for you. And they were like, uh, we can't do it. But the one on the bottom said, when you asked me to participate, I was worried I couldn't commit an hour a week. And now it's the hour I look most forward to in my work week. And that to me is like gold. Um, and so the, 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 uh, the word of mouth, the, um, so th this same practitioner was the one who got a friend in West Virginia. And they got a friend in um, Botswana who joined our clinic twice. So we've reached as far as Botswana, which is pretty exciting to all of us. So um, again, I think um, it's the word of mouth, it's the buy-in, it's the, um, the collegiality that I really like. So we've really gotten to know, like we've had part nurse practitioners, one of our nurse practitioners' son got married. She showed pictures over the Echo Clinic of her son's wedding. It's really become a community of, uh, of people who support each other. We learn a ton from them too. Um, we just got this um, guy who, who was about to retire <laughs> to join us, and he said, you know, um, let me know if I can be helpful. I really think everyone should be doing this stuff. So again, it's that word of mouth. So this is Kennedy. It's, uh, this is where we live, and this is where we operate our ECHO. And I'm happy to take questions too uh, at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. That was really refreshing. And can we use your statement as testimony to recruit providers? <laughs> that, that was really good. That I'm not good at technology, but I really love Project Echo. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so next up is West Virginia Clinical and Translation Institute, uh, Jay Mason. All right, so my name is Jay Mason. I'm with the West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute. And my main area of uh, job duties is the Project Echo Manager for West Virginia. Um, and the CTSI allows us to really uh, be the infrastructure for Project Echo uh, in West Virginia, where as most of you probably know, West Virginia does not have much infrastructure and very much uh, grant money and things like that. So the CTSI was the partner of choice for this. Um, so how it got started in West Virginia? Um, actually, the idea came from a federally qualified health system called Cabin Creek Health Systems in Charleston area of West Virginia. Um, they came to the CTSI, who they've partnered with us before on various uh, research projects and, and clinical type projects, and said they had this great idea to do this Project Echo. Have you ever heard of it? And we said no. <laughs> and so we uh, basically went to the immersion training and, and created, uh, you know, the replication partner application in December of 2015 and actually got a uh, Benetton grant to do the startup. So we were able to send us to the training and also have a launch event to help recruit. Um, and then really what separates us, and, and a lot of them have talked about it already, is these partnerships, you know, established partnerships to help with recruitment. Um, the CTSI has, it, uh, has developed the West Virginia Practice-Based Research Network, which is an 86-site uh, network in West Virginia of clinical primary care sites. Um, then we also have the Primary Care Association in West Virginia. And then we just recently partnered with the Area Health Education Centers. So these are non-medical um, folk that really are into Project ECHO and like getting the word out. So we've really started with promotion and recruitment through those three avenues. So just some background, we have five projects. We started in it, almost two years, we're almost at our two year anniversary. Uh, we started with hepatitis C, then moved on to chronic pain, medication assisted treatment, psychiatry, and chronic lung disease. Um, and I'll get into how those topics were kind of uh, picked uh, to start with, but um, some overall stats since April 1st. Um, 37 participating organizations just in West Virginia, which is 
unbelievable. We never thought we would get to that in the little as two years. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, had 108 sessions over all those projects, uh, 152 cases reviewed, 63 didactic presentations. So in two years, not too shabby. Again, the partners cannot stress enough that our recruitment would have not gone the way, it, you know, and been successful without these established partnerships through the CTSI, the PBRN, the Cabin Creek Health Systems. I mean, they were really the, the champions that really got the word out and, and made it successful and had people join in West Virginia. So how do we pick the topics? So we have those five projects. They have all come from the community. We, get, we started with hepatitis C because that's what Cabin Creek Health systems wanted to start with. They had a problem with their testing and their treatment. So we started with that. Probably a month in, folks were getting on, and after the session was over, they were staying on going, have you ever thought about doing psychology? Have you ever thought about doing medication-assisted treatment? You know, so those, I mean, we just made a list, and we were like, we'll just try to do the best we can and, and launch as many as we can with the funds that we have. Um, and so that's, that's what we try to do. Um, now we've started getting to more academic uh, Partners are getting interested in starting ECHO projects, and so what we try to do is have them actually partner with a community member to kind of flesh out the idea to make sure people will attend. It's something that is important to them in their clinic. Uh, it's just not coming down from, you know, the ivory tower saying, you need to learn this. Uh, so we ask them to do that. And we have an electronic uh, tracking system called iLab that we submit a little summary of what the project is, and that way we can kind of flesh out the idea and have it reviewed by our review committee, which is the ECHO director, the manager, myself, and we have actually just had hired a coordinator. And then we uh, rotate a community provider and a clinic administrator through the review process. And the administrator is the key, because they're the ones who are going to block off the time for their providers to go to these sessions. So if you can get them on board, you're golden. So that's why we added them to the review process. Um, and then once they are approved, then we start the planning, which is coming up with any agreements, CME application, case forms, all that kind of stuff. So this is how ours operate. You have the three different kind of groups. You know, everybody knows about the spokes, everybody knows about the hub, but the interesting one for us is the staff. So the staff is me and one other person. And until, up until November of last year, it was just me. Um, and we facilitate all the sessions. We do all the IT, we do all the CME, we do all of that. The hub does not worry about any of that stuff. And that was one of the first things they told us was that we don't want to facilitate. We are scared to death to try to provide recommendations and also make sure everybody has a chance to speak. So they really charged us to do that and it has worked great. We are the ones that are in constant communication, the planning, all that diagram there, that is the ECHO staff for sure and has really made the hub excited about doing it. You know, they, they tell us that, you know, this is a great way to, for them to fulfill their service, uh, you know, in their contract, that little, um, and they, you know, rather than going to grand rounds or reviewing posters, they'd much rather come and do this. So this is, this is a way to kind of keep them involved is having them just do what they want to do. So what's working? Um, we have, you know, the ideas coming from the community, which basically is guaranteeing you attendance. It's guaranteeing you spoke recruitment, cases, all that kind of stuff. Um, you create this learning collaborative. Everybody's really kind of touched on that before. You know, they kind of, they become partners. They become, you know, they understand that they're all going through the same thing. And so it really kind of builds that collaborative. Um, uh, the staff, we talked about that. But the last two are kind of interesting. Technology in West Virginia. Everybody thinks West Virginia coal mining, you know, who, what's the internet, that kind of thing. Um, we do not have that problem. In fact, that we actually use electronic case forms now. All of our case forms are online uh, forms that you can fill out and they come into a database. I mean, when we tell that, when we go to uh, New Mexico and have kind of conversations with other groups, they're like, really? You know, West Virginia, you guys, you know, internet everywhere? I'm like, yep. <laughs> so so it's, it's been great. And uh, it just proves that you can do anything, you know, technology in West Virginia, it can happen. Um, and then continuing education credits, that's been a great draw. Everybody's kind of talked about that. And it's really a value added for them. So really recommend it, it that you have to do that. Challenges, provider burnout. West Virginia is such a small state, small amount of providers. It's really hard finding that second and third provider in a clinic to come and kind of take the burden off somebody going to five different ones. 
Um, you know, not enough days in a week. We're having two to three sessions a week, you know, and you're asking somebody who sees 50 patients, you know, before two, you know, to try to block off an hour is just really hard. So how can we get into that clinic a little bit deeper to the second and third person? And then finding the right time of day. You know, we do it at the lunch hour, either from 12 to 1 or 12.15 to 1.15, but then people will get on and say, it'd be great if it was from 4 to 5 or if it was from 7 to 8 in the morning. You know, there's just, you're not going to be able to please everybody, so you have to be able to kind of be flexible and really make sure your website is up to date. I mean, everybody has a great website that's already talked. I mean, that is so important where they can go get that information if they can't attend a certain session or something like that. That is really important. Maybe. There we go. So lessons learned. We're a small operation. It is two people working on a now $40,000 budget to do all these projects, pay for the CME, all that kind of stuff. Um, we've just been very fortunate with the CTSI that we have some money that don't, you know, we don't have to use that Benin money or any grant or foundation money that we have towards any of our, my time or the coordinator's time. We can use that for CME. We can pay the specialists their time. Um, so it's very, you know, you can do it. Like Erica said, you can do it on a small budget. Um, trying to look for more funding constantly, you know, applying for foundation money, her some money, whatever it is. But then also being creative with your partnerships. Um, I mentioned the area health educators. Um, they have their own HRSA grant, and they wrote us into that grant. So they gave us a portion of their grant money to promote and pay for CME. So being creative is, you know, how we've been able to, to uh, sustain our projects. And then being proactive. This is every day of every week we are doing something for ECHO. We're communicating with the hubs. We're finding about the cases. Maybe we're, maybe we're going uh, on the road, like some have said. We have hold uh, the sessions at some of the community clinics where myself or the coordinator will actually go down there and they'll launch the clinic from there so they can see how it works, kind of like behind the scenes, behind the curtain. So it's kind of neat. So you just have to be creative on how to keep people energized and things like that. And uh, again, using the existing partnerships and the website is the key for sure. So I will take questions as well at the end. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Jay. This was so wonderful. Um, and we learned something new about West Virginia uh, for electronic forms. I'm really excited about that. I would like to learn more. And now, um, last but not least, and please welcome um, Ms. Uh, D Dr. Amanda Bennett. Thank you very much. Um, so I am here from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, and also here from the Autism Treatment Network, which is funded by Autism Speaks, which is how we were able to start our Echo Autism Clinic. So, oh. Sensitive. Okay, so um, so Echo Autism was actually started by Dr. Kristen Soul from the University of Missouri's Thompson Center, um, and she received HRSA funding through the Autism Intervention Research Network for Physical Health, we call it AIRP, um, to study Echo Autism. So she did a one-year pilot of her Echo Autism clinic and then expanded to 10 sites within the Autism Treatment Network to study it further. Um, so just to give you a, a sense of the curriculum, so my ECHO clinic was handed to me. It was a research study, grant funded. These are your didactic sessions you're going to be doing so that we could keep things standardized across multiple sites, but these are the curriculum topics that we were covering, and it really ranges from basic, what is autism, how do you screen, what do you do if you think someone has autism, to more complicated issues around comorbidities, medical and behavioral health particularly. So the Echo Autism Research Study at CHOP started in January of 2017. We were one of the first two sites to um, study it after the University of Missouri pilot. And it was a six-month intervention. We had two sessions per month. Um, and we had 12 primary care providers participating um, from four states. So we served both rural and inner city Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and West Virginia. Um, and our outcomes that we were looking at were primary care screening and identification of autism symptoms. We were also looking at PCP management of the medical and psychiatric comorbidities. Um, and we did this through having the primary care physicians complete questionnaires as well as doing clinic chart reviews. So we went into the clinic and reviewed their patient charts. We did this at baseline, midway through the clinic at the very end of the six month 
sessions and then three months after the clinic was over. Um, so from, a, from the preliminary study from the University of Missouri, um, they did see improvements in primary care self-efficacy and their ability to screen and manage ASD, um, better adherence to the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for autism screening, um, as well as use of autism-specific resources that are out there online and in the community. Um, and the primary care providers reported very high satisfaction with the clinic. This is our clinic from CHOP. So um, we, we hold our clinic the first and third Thursday of every month. It's about an hour and a half. During the study, it was a two-hour clinic. Um, we've shortened it a little bit to try and accommodate the primary care providers who really couldn't carve out that much time from their day. So right now we do intro. We have one case discussion, one didactic, and wrap up. And our team right now consists of myself as the developmental behavioral pediatrician. We also have a clinical psychologist, a social worker, community resource specialist, and a parent, which is really important for the autism clinics, um, the parent perspective. So a couple of topics have come up repeatedly here. So things that we've learned. Um, you know, in terms of funding, our 2017 ECHO Autism that lasted from January to July was HRSA funded. We had money for every single hub member to participate in every single clinic. Um, we had buy-in from the medical directors of the primary care clinics that um, participants were coming from to carve out time to be able to participate in the study as a self-limited six-month commitment. Um, our clinic ended last summer. We had to take a little hiatus so that we could do data collection, and then we restarted in January. And we restarted as an unfunded, in-kind clinical service that CHOP now provides. And it, I tell people it really is a labor of love. I don't get paid to do it. None of my team gets paid to do it. We, we give our time to make it happen. Um, we are actively working, my boss especially, my division chief is actively working to figure out how to fund this because we want to keep it going, but it's not being paid for and that won't last forever at CHOP. So um, it's, uh, if anybody knows any good donors, send them my way. Um, so in terms of outreach, people have talked about this. So continuing medical educa education was a, was a great, um, service that we were able to provide to the participants during the study. Um, it's been harder to get CME credits approved at CHOP as a CHOP is kind of slower to come to telehealth and, and virtual sessions and so getting the CME office on board with that has been difficult but we did just receive approval within our institution to offer part four MOC credit. So that is the new enticement that we're offering to primary care providers. For the study, we've partnered with the CHOP Primary Care Network, but we did also reach out to the local AAP chapters. Um, and I, a lot of what people talked about, I went to my hometown and talked to pediatricians in my hometown. I went back to my residency office and contacted my friends from training and said, hey, do you think anybody would want to participate in this? Um, and then uh, we have um, an, a, a pretty large Center for Autism Research at CHOP that sends emails out to anyone that's interested in autism or ever wants to learn about autism. And it goes to parents, it goes to providers, it goes to um, people in the community. And we sent out an e-blast um, this winter, just a single email advertising the autism, the Echo Autism Clinic. And we had extreme interest, more than 100 people that were interested in participating and signing up as a spoke. Now, most of them were not medical providers, so this is an echo autism for medical providers. Most of the people that were interested were um, allied health, health professionals, so we had special educators, we had OTs, PTs, speech therapists, so it makes me feel like that needs to be the next echo autism that we create, um, but we, you know, we're still trying to kind of get the word out. And then in terms of lessons learned for operation, um, you know, we ended our clinic in July. We restarted in, in January after we'd finished our data collection, and it's been really slow. So it was a little reassuring to hear that the first several clinics only had one or two participants, because that's what my clinic has been since 
January because of flu season. We had lots and lots of PCPs that were emailing us saying, I really wanted to come today, but I'm, you know, I've seen 100 kids this morning with flu and RSV. So the winter months have been tough. I'm hoping that that's going to change. Um, and then this, this concept of the lunch hour has been interesting because that was definitely what we were told, you need to have it over the lunch hour. But the challenge of finding a time for these clinics is something that we're still kind of working on as well. So we actually do a hold our clinic from 11.30 to 1.00. And it's pretty flexible, so some people sign on late, um, some people have to leave early. Uh, we don't have a lunch hour that I can see. None of the providers that participate in our clinic actually get that lunch hour. Um, so those are some of the challenges. So getting people to participate after the research study is something we're still working on. Identifying case presentations has come up a lot. So I've, I've gotten very comfortable with winging it. So most of the time our providers do not send a case ahead of time. They may not put it on a case form. The last couple of sessions we've had, people signed on and I said, hey, great, you're here. Do you have any cases you want to present to our team? And people always have somebody that they're thinking of that they want to talk about. And that's how we've been able to kind of keep the clinic going. And it's been great discussion every single time. Um, but it's not usually pre-planned. Um, why we continue to do this? So, you know, for us, I think that um, initially, I saw this as a way to contribute to evidence um, and, and um, contribute to the science in terms of how we can spread information about autism. Um, the multi-site trial is still actually happening, so we were one of the first sites, but the last few are still um, participating in echo clinics and collecting data, so there will be more results coming and more publications coming in the future. Um, there's definitely an evidence of need. We saw this as we talked to primary care providers. Um, we see this in terms of the rates of screening now, which are still pretty abysmal um, when the AAP looks at that. So we know that PCPs are interested in this knowledge um, and they are frequently reaching out to us through emails and if I, if I go somewhere and someone finds out I do autism, they usually come up and say, hey, I've got this case, I've got this kid I wanna ask you about. So we know that, that people want to learn about autism. It's just the challenge of figuring out how to make it happen. And then I put a note about goosebump moments, you know, um, when I went to the immersion training in New Mexico, I thought it sounded really cool. Dr. Soul in Missouri is so enthusiastic. She loved Echo, raving about it. And I don't know, maybe I've been in Philly too long. I just thought, oh, how is this really going to be as good <laughs> as people say it is? I was a little skeptical. My team was a little skeptical. But we had this grant. We had this funding. We were going to make it happen. So we did it. And our participants had time carved out of their schedule, their medical directors had said, yes, you may do this, and they were um, also a little bit skeptical, I think. They weren't sure they could give the time. They weren't sure that they wanted to spend their time doing that. And um, when we started the clinics, there was uh, our parent partner, I can remember there was a clinic where some of the things that were said by the primary care providers made her cringe. I could see her nails digging into the chair, some of the things that people were saying about their beliefs and their attitudes about autism. Six months later, one of our last sessions, um, we had active case presentations. People were asking to present. We didn't have enough sessions left to present the cases that people wanted to present. And the, one of the last presentations we had was a provider who was really concerned because a coworker in her office had a child that she was sure had autism, and she was about to be giving this diagnosis, which she would never have considered doing six months earlier. She would have made them wait on the wait list to go see the specialist, but she felt comfortable and confident enough that she knew this was what it was. She needed to tell this person. And her question to us wasn't, how do I do it? Or is this autism? She already knew that. Her question was, I know this parent is going to want to know what she can expect for her child, and I don't know how to help I don't know how to, what to tell her about that. How do I tell her what to anticipate? And how do I counsel her through that? And, you know, my team, we start writing notes. We start kind of thinking about things we're going to say. And I facilitate. So I said, okay, we're going to open it up for questions, going to open it up for comments from the participants. And each spoke. 
raised their hand and started saying, well, you know, when I had a kid that had developmental concerns, this was something, this, this is how I explain developmental concerns in my clinic now, or this is how I talk to families about autism, or this is how I talk about, um, you know, a chronic condition. And by the time they were finished, I had nothing to say. <laughs> they had covered everything that I would have, including our parent who always has something to say. She had nothing to say. Um, so I saw this group grow so much in that six months. And for me, that's why we keep doing it even though we're not paid to. So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Burnett, for that compelling story. Really uh, enjoyed it. So I'll just open uh, up uh, the panel for the questions, and please uh, raise hands if you want to ask questions to the panel. Yeah, so my question is, so for the majority of the hubs, are the cases known ahead of time? And if so, are the didactics geared towards the case presentations? So, uh, for the most part, in a perfect world, yes, you'd get the cases beforehand so you can send them to the hub to have them review. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, one suggestion would be to have your hub members do four to five mock cases that you have in the bank that they could then present and, and kind of the roles are reversed. They're asking the spokes, what would they do with this case? What would they do? Um, and the didactics, uh, no, sometimes they line up. Uh, sometimes they don't. We're, we're fairly flexible in our curriculum. We kind of have an outline, but we're kind of trying to make it uh, geared towards them. So if there's something they want to hear that week, even though it might not be directly related to the case, we'll still go ahead and do that. In our case, um, at the Weizmann Institute, we have actually different echoes, have different approaches for chronic pain. No matter what kind of chronic pain uh, or pain issue you have, uh, you want to present, you present, regardless of um, the didactic topic. For our complex integrated pediatrics, we are really hoping and we've been getting the cases aligning with the didactics. But I think it's, it could be challenging when you have a limited number of participants to be that specific because you know, providers bring the most challenging cases that they have at the current time, so it may not necessarily match the didactic. I was just going to echo on, ha, -ha. <laughs> no pun intended, um, right, on something that she just said, that um, many times the cases that come from the spokes are very complex. So at the hub, we have a bank of pretty simple, straightforward cases that we will use. And so when nobody has... Um, turned in the day before a case, we'll just do our own cases because, you know, it's not necessarily so much at that point about the case, it's about the engagement and the continuous learning and the building of the community. And, um, you know, 90% of our time, the didactics don't have anything much to do with the case other than, a, a, you know, large umbrella topic that's related. So one more thing about that. So we have, we have plants, we have trainees that join us. We have some regulars and some periodic. And so at the last hour, if nobody has a case, we'll have them present one of their cases. So we always have this, this kind of backup and it's really, it's, it's been helpful. And they have challenging cases too and the, the um, participants appreciate that. So we're lucky to have that. It, just if you're thinking about um, starting a project echo, it's really important that you have this figured out ahead of time because otherwise it's quite stressful. You know, like you have, like, you know, tomorrow you have an echo and you have no cases that does not sound good and you're going to have a very stressed out coordinator. So as a coordinator, um, I, and a family nurse practitioner, student recent graduate, I created a lot of cases just so that we would be sure to have one. Um, and then there have been a couple times where I've just thought up something on the fly, like, hey, while I have the heart failure specialist on the line, I have a parent of a pediatric patient I've seen who I'm concerned about because of the way they're breathing during the appointment. So even, you know, like I have no medical background, I have no other information to offer, but we're able to kind of talk about things that maybe other providers are seeing um, without a formal case presentation. Oh, I got the microphone. I guess I get to ask a question. Anyway, these have been really good case presentations, the goosebumps and all. 
Um, I've heard several times the word immersion training. If you want to open up an ECHO program, should we go to New Mexico, get the immersion training? Does that make us better situated for a HRSA grant to say we did New Mexico immersion training? Yes, so, um, and it's free. So, can I jump in on that one? Uh, yeah. So um, if I can jump in on that one. So there are lots of ways to get involved with ECHO. You can join an existing ECHO hub. There are now ECHO hubs that address so many different topics. And the vast majority of them are open and um, without charge. There is a join an ECHO tab on our website that you can find an interactive map that will help guide you as to echoes available in each region in each topic it's not perfect and if you'd like to if you're not convinced that you've seen everything please contact us we'd be happy to hook you up with any other echo hub and that includes one you might want to um, uh, talk to and learn from um, they can help give you their own perspective. As you've heard, it's so valuable to hear from Echoes doing Echo. Um, but in terms of becoming trained and authorized to do Echo, it generally is a two to three day immersion experience that is offered by any one of our authorized super hubs. So now we have generic super hubs. We offer training to really any organization that wishes to do Echo for free. Um, at the Echo Institute at UNM, and we offer this monthly. You do have to sign partnership documents ahead of time, and that's true for every Echo training um, that you need to join. If you want to become an Echo Hub, you have to sign partnership agreements. You agree to a few basic principles, like calling it Echo and using our branding and um, uh, the principle of sharing um, uh, your materials, your IP generated by and for doing Echo with the Echo community. So if you agree to those principles, you're ready for training. The training is offered all over the place and it depends on where you are and what you'd like to do. So there's training in London and in uh, Wyoming and in Missouri and at MD Anderson specifically for cancer in Toronto, et cetera. So there are multiple training sites. We just are the most frequent offerers of this training. But yes, it's expected that to launch an Echo Hub, you are going to be trained. Um, to echo haha, what Erica said, it is absolutely worth it. And um, not I have other than I like Erica and um, Sanjeev, even going to New Mexico, it is an unbelievable experience. Um, I was a late adapter to the concept and um, totally drank the Kool Aid. Going into the Echo Building is mind blowing. So I haven't had any experience with any of the training at any of the other super hubs, but I can say there's nothing like going, and, and Albuquerque is an awesome city, nothing like going to the Echo training at the Echo store. And I will ditto that sentiment from Rosalind. The other thing I would say that you get out of the Echo training is the your liaison, your Echo liaison, which is, you know, ours is Salil, and Salil and I are best friends. I don't know if she feels the same way. But, I mean, we contact her all the time. You know, she's a great resource whenever you're trying to start up. You know, she's there to help you with Box and IEC. I mean, it's just going there and getting that access is unbelievable. More questions? I'll just jump in on the bandwagon as well. So I went to the Echo Training at the end of January. It's, uh, it's very well organized. Uh, the, the staff have it down. Um, they, they cover a bunch of topics. It was, a, it was an awful lot of information at once, but it's a good use of your time all three days. And by the third day, they go through mock echo, you know, a mock echo, you participate, you experience the roles, you feel prepared when you get back, and you have a better, the, the light bulb goes off when you're there, basically. And we had a few people um, participate at the last session in March, and they I emailed them, hey, here's a dinner suggestion, and they wrote back, hey, thanks so much. Now I get what you're telling me about Echo. I understand it. I'm excited. So it's, it's a good use of time. So. Thank you very much.